Uh, oh, here he is. <laughs> Sean, the floor is yours. All right. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Thank you. Thank you all so much for coming. If you don't mind, if I just, where are you all from? Uh, Terry and I are from Kearsarge. Kearsarge? Yeah. Also, we had some folks from Kearsarge last time. Hopkinton. Hopkinton, hey, yeah. rock stars, Hopkinton. You see those bulbs out there? I saw, were you out there taking a picture with Flat Stanley? I was. Yes. That's I'm awesome. From, so we just moved here from New York. Yeah. And our, one of my little friends in New York sent me a Flat Stanley, a Flat Stanley and said, we need some pictures in touch. We <laughs> saw you out there. <laughs> Flat Stanley was so much fun. We saw you out the window. My, when my admin supervisor yeah. was like, she's got two things. I'm like, she's taking a picture yeah. of Flat Stanley. <laughs> I love it, but I would, my story was all those bulbs that you see blooming there in the front, yeah. planted, by, planted by Hopkinton High, Hopkinton High School students. Awesome. That's a lot of them. Yes, yes, sir. Manchester. You're from Manchester. Awesome. And I am not a teacher. Yes, I am. <laughs> <laughs> you're with a I mean, nice doctor, and you're with teachers. <laughs> yeah. Big heroes of mine came here and did a project um, with the lacrosse team. Oh, yeah. Yeah, the lacrosse team came here and they cleaned all the headstones in section 43 and 44. We did a presentation. It. it was fantastic. So I just wanted to highlight that we're, this program is having impacts. You know, we've had students here, a couple classes come, and it's been <clears> awesome. So I'm just going to talk to you a little bit about the State Veterans Cemetery, what we do here. I'm, by the way, I'm Sean Buck. I'm the director of the cemetery. I've been the director for four and a half years. My predecessor is running around here somewhere wearing a light blue shirt. Right. He was here for ten years before me. There he is, Mike. So everything I do is upon his shoulders. That's this, for sure. Right? This is what you Sean's going to look like. <laughs> <laughs> but just a couple of weeks if I'm lucky. Um, so there's a quick agenda. Just a little bit about me too. I'm a, I'm a veteran. I spent 21 years. I'm a retired Army dude. You know, loved it. And I'm just so grateful to work here and be a part of the veterans community and, and to honor veterans and their families in this way. So there's a little bit of what we're going to talk about. I'll try not to bore you too much. I'll try to blow, blow through it as quickly as possible. We'll give you the important stuff. So why do veteran cemeteries even exist? So there were national cemeteries. Everybody's heard of Arlington. And, you know, for a long time, there were only national cemeteries. And the closest one to us here in New Hampshire was in Bourne, which is on Cape Cod. Then there was another one up in Maine. And so... In the 70s, they, as the World War II generation started to pass away, they started to say, hey, we need more veteran cemeteries so that people can get to them. And the goal is to be within 75 miles of 95% of the population. That's kind of the goal, so that people can get to a veteran cemetery. So the federal government decided to start partnering with states. And so states, not every state has veteran cemeteries, although at this point, most do. So in the mid-80s, they started talking about it in New Hampshire. In the 90s, it gained a lot of steam. In 95, they signed a law. I think I got that right, Rich. And in 97 <laughs> is when they opened the New Hampshire State Veterans Cemetery. We just had our 25th anniversary just this last September. So, um, so basically, we partner with the federal government to provide a veterans cemetery. But this is a state veterans cemetery. Everybody who works here is a state employee. The state has a budget for us. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more about that as we get on. So the standards are the same, though, essentially. I mean, obviously, it's going to be a little more fancy at Arlington. They've got way more resources than we do. But at the end of the day, the honors for the veterans are the same. You know? And the rules that we follow are the same. Um, fun fact, actually, Arlington falls under the Department of the Army. It's the only one that does. Um, everything else falls under the VA, uh, the National Cemetery Administration, which is a, an arm of the Veterans Administration. So we, fall under, we follow the rules of the VA. Um, what are the types of burials we offer? It's interesting. I was just telling Ruth earlier. Um, yesterday I did a service. Um, we're really short-staffed right now, so I was out handling the service, and um, about a nine-year-old girl started asking me a bunch of questions, like, why are some headstones closer together than other ones? And it was really interesting to me that she didn't know, and who would think to talk about them? So I talked about cremations, and so if you walk around out there, the headstones that are very close together, those are cremated remains. Those urns, there's urns buried there. You'd be amazed how many people ask me, how does the casket fit in that small <laughs> space? Is it up and down? You know, I was like, no, it's urns. But people don't know, you know? So um, we, have full we have full casket out of the mouths of babes, you know? And they just started asking me all these questions, and it was awesome. Um, we do the in-ground cre cremated remains with upright granite headstone, full casket burials, and you'll notice those out there. And then we do uh, cremated remains in a um, columbarium wall, and you'll see those walking around out there. Some veteran cemeteries have scatter gardens. We do not have one. 
Um, and one veteran cemetery, I said, I said a few, but it's really just one in Maine, offers reading burials. Um, something I've explored a little bit, very difficult, a lot of work to do. Maybe we'll get there, but not there yet. Um, we offer brief committal services, so 20 minutes. This is the end. This isn't, a, this isn't a funeral, a memorial service. This is a committal service, 20 minutes, the very end, mainly focused on the military honors and the final blessings of the gravesite, if you choose to do blessings. Um, most, I would say most VA cemeteries require it to be in the chapel or the, sh the communal shelter. We do allow burials at the gravesite, so you can do the service right where the gravesite is. Okay. Oh, last, last thing here. This is really important. This is a benefit veterans earn. There's no cost at, at all for anything for the veteran here. Not the use of the facilities, not opening and closing the grave, not the headstone, nothing. There's no cost. We have a small fee for dependents, $350. Um, and it's due on the day of interment. We don't take any advanced payments or anything. Can I ask a quick question? Of course you can ask me a question anytime. Please okay. stop me. What's a green burial area? Ah, green. <laughs> so green burials are just a type of burial where you, they're very environmentally friendly. Yeah. Um, and so typically what they'll do is they'll put the, in the body in some sort of biodegradable shroud or a yeah, basket or something. Okay. And then you just bury it yeah. in the ground. Okay. Like all of our caskets are in concrete Vaults right. or, or yeah. whatever. Yeah. Um, a lot of pollution. I think the number I've heard is like a hundred million tons a year of concrete goes into the ground to store caskets, wow. which seems not environmentally cool to me. Yeah. You know, yeah. so you're starting to see a little movement, a lot more towards, hey, let's just bury the body. And yeah. in, I read somewhere 18 months that the, the majority of the body is about is kind of you know, yeah. in decomposed. Yeah. Yeah. There's yeah. the word I look for. Need the more science. <laughs> um, that's our cemetery. Um, so just all the areas in the colors, we have not started burying it, or we haven't even started developing. So people come in, you'd be amazed how many people say, are you running out of room? Not even close. We have 104 <laughs> acres, of which nearly 60 we can develop. When you're walking around on the grounds today, that's only 19. You know, so we have a lot. All the woods around here we own. Okay, I have a staff of 10. Right now we're down two full-time and one part-time person. So, you know, we're, um, you know, but we keep up. The, guy, the, 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 the guys and get ladies that work here are awesome. They all look at this as their service. Like, this is how I serve. There's a couple of us who are veterans, but the ones who aren't, they feel like this is how I'm serving our country, and I agree with that 100%. I have another expansion due in the next year. We're going to build some more columbariums and some more in-ground cremation space. Again, I mentioned we're state facility, staffed by state employees that so talk about the guidelines. Here's a couple things I want to highlight. We have no state residency requirement. We don't care if you're from New Hampshire. We don't care if you've even been to New Hampshire. You can be interned here if you're better and you qualify. We don't discriminate in that way. Service requirement. Before, this is really important. I want to highlight this. Previously, to be eligible, you had to have served on active duty um, for a period of time. Um, if you were in the National Guard or the Reserves, you were only eligible if you retired out of the National Guard or Reserves or were activated federally and completed that, that deployment. In, in March of last year, President Biden signed a rule, signed a law that made allowed state veteran cemeteries to bury members of the Guard and Reserves if they choose. They, without losing any funding. Before, we would lose our federal funding if we did it. Um, but he signed that into law, and I'm going to tell you, he signed that into law largely because of New Hampshire delegates, like mm -hmm. our members of Congress and Senate. The four that are in this state worked hard to make this happen. And I, I got to give them a shout out. You hear it? They get dissed all the time. They worked really hard to make this happen. It got signed, and in June, we started bearing members of the Guard and Reserve. We're really proud of that. Only like three or four states are doing it as of right now. But I'm going to tell you, I get a lot of emails from states asking me, hey, how did you guys do this? How did you guys write your rules and regulations? I'm so proud of that. I am so, so proud that New Hampshire leads in this. Um, so I want to highlight that because it gives me goosebumps. Um, generally, you're eligible if you have an honorable or general discharge out of the military and you complete your term of service or for whatever reason. I always say, if you know a veteran, tell them to apply. Don't self-select out. Don't say, oh, maybe that's... Let us decide. It, you know, it's hard. I, it, it, I hate when I have to say no, and I will say no if they're not eligible. But don't self-select out and miss out on a benefit that you've earned. And why, oh, by the way, yes, why sir? the 1980-81 break? Is that just because it started one way and then? Yeah, they ended? just changed the rules. They changed the rules. So yeah. if you were before 1980, all you need it, it, this is actually day on service. One yeah, day, okay. one wow. day on active duty, and that's that was really one of the things that bothered me about this. So like yeah. you'd have somebody 
joined the military in 1973, served three days, and got out for whatever reason, medical, whatever, they're eligible. Then you got somebody who served eight years in the National Guard but never deployed, not eligible. That seemed crazy to me. So, um, yeah, good question. Thanks. All right. Um, it's a, again, I mentioned it's a VA benefit, no charge. So you do know we're a state veteran cemetery funded by the state, but we do receive plot allowances. So whenever we bury a veteran, the VA gives us money for that. So probably anywhere from 50 to 75% of our budget annually is reimbursed to us either from the federal government or from the fees that we collect for the dependent burials. Um, the federal government pays for all of our expansions. So when I, when I, I apply to the federal government, the Veterans Cemetery Grants Program, to build these columbariums and increase our in-ground cremation space, they pay for that. We fund the first 10% that they reimburse us for. I'm in the process of that right now. Um, I talked about the committal service. I talked about all this stuff. So we've already kind of covered all this. I covered that. We're in good shape. The only thing, the only thing I would add, though, Sean, because I know the kids ask a lot about this, is the dependent children part. Because uh, uh, that really throws kids off when they see a child out there. Yeah, great oh, question. Yeah. So dependents, we, def we define dependents. Great question, Ruth. Thank you for that. Um, I want to highlight two things. One, dependents are eligible through the because of the veteran. So let's say it doesn't matter if the dependent dies first; they can come here. The veteran doesn't even have to come here. So dependent and veteran are married. When one of them dies, vet, let's say the veteran dies, gets buried in a civilian cemetery, the, the dependent can still come. Here. That dependent is eligible based on being married to that veteran. Secondly, children, dependent children are eligible. So a dependent child is any child under the age of 18, under the age of 21 if they're a full-time college student, or a full-time college student, or if they have a disability in which they can never live on their own. It requires a doctor's note, stuff like that. But there are dependent children uh, buried out there. You know, not a ton, but they're not, not just a few. I just kind of I throw this up there as a just fun fact. I mean, one full casket equals three in-ground cremations in terms of square footage equals 240 niches, you know. So you can kind of see the, the, the columbariums, we can really get a lot of bang for the buck. The more folks who go on the columbariums, we really get a lot. And so when I talk about how long the cemetery is going to last, I say we're good for at least another 80 years. But here in New Hampshire, about 80% of our interments are cremation. Um, so the more that number goes up, the longer we last. Just some fun, just some facts about the cemetery. I'll update. I'll update it in another month or so. I update it every year at the end of our fiscal year. But it just gives you a feel for you know. It's what, biggest is Army. The Army is the biggest service. We have a National Guard here. It all makes sense. Um, just a few years ago, in fact, my first year here, I think that the Vietnam era passed up the World War II era. So I would say most of our burials now are Vietnam era service. Although we still bury World War II era veterans. Um, we have 13 folks here killed in action. Um, one is from the Vietnam War. His, his remains were transferred from a, a, a civilian cemetery, um, and the rest were in the global war on terror. 41 XPOWs, and you can kind of see all this. When it says, I want to highlight this real quick too. When it says Vietnam on a headstone marker out there, it just means that that veteran served during the Vietnam era. It doesn't mean they went to Vietnam. Now, I will tell you, this is one of the number one things, and Michael back me up on this. Some, some guys from Vietnam don't want, they're like, I didn't go, I don't feel like I should. I always tell them, look, your heroic act was volunteering to serve. I served in the military. I had this much choice almost of where I went. They said, Buck, you're going here. I'm okay. That's where I went, you know? And so um, I just feel like, look, the border in, back then we had the, you know, the German, the, the border in West and East Germany and with Russia. Dudes had to, and gals had to be there too. So thanks for serving. And so I don't want people to not put that on if they've earned it. But some still don't want it. Okay, I feel like I skipped one there. I did? Did I? No. Yeah. Yep, there we go. All right, a couple highlights. Um, the Momoa walkway, it's right out there. Uh, we're going to do that on the tour. This learning center you're in. Um, the 20 points of military history out on the circle of flags. You guys will see that on your tour. The chapel, you'll see all that stuff on here. Sure. This is the thing I really want to spend a lot of time on, as if I haven't spent enough time already. Um, the Veterans Cemetery Association is putting this on. They are awesome. All volunteers, no money, 100% of all donations that come to the Veterans Cemetery through the Veterans Cemetery Association comes to this, comes to helping our cemetery, 100%. These folks are awesome and they donate their time. 
Um, they they built this. They the Memorial Walkway, all privately funded. No, you know, no federal funds. They take care of that. They raise money through trees for Bosco, and they, they help us build this noise reduction burn, which hopefully we'll point out to you on our tour out there. Uh, when we built this new section, it was just so dang loud with the traffic on, in, on the interstate. So we put together the money, we built this huge berm to try to offset the noise a little bit. And I didn't, people talk about putting like this wall up there, I'm like, no. Uh, to me, I just didn't feel reverent. But the, the, the berm, it's got plants and flowers, it's awesome. 100 Nights of Remembrance. We play taps here at the Veterans Center. It started here in New Hampshire by a guy named Noel. What's Noel's last name, Mike? Taylor. Noel, Noel Taylor. Thank you. <laughs> um, that started here, and other states are copying it. We play taps every night, 7 p.m., from Memorial Day to 9-11. It's awesome. And then through the rest of the year, they play taps on every Sunday at 1 o'clock in the afternoon. These are all volunteers. They just come out and play taps. So if you pop out here at 7 o'clock on a weeknight in the summer, there'll be somebody playing taps out here. And it's really cool. And you'd be surprised if quite a few folks show up. Like, you know, 8, 10, 12 people will be here. On weekends, there's cars here all the time. Um, we do Reeves for Boswin. Um, that's the Reeves Across America. You guys have probably heard about that. We kind of broke contact with the Reeves Across America. We buy our Reeves from New Hampshire. We have it, we, the Reeves Across America is done from Worcester Reeves up in Maine. We were like, we're not buying them from them anymore. We're going to buy them from a New Hampshire company. We're going to raise the money ourselves. And I'm grateful to the Blue Star Mothers of New Hampshire for doing that. Always the first Saturday in December, always at 10.30. So you show up here on the first Saturday morning in December, 10.30 in the morning, we're placing Reeves on Reeves. Um, standing with fallen comrades, when you'd be surprised how often remains get dropped off here with no next of kin. Somebody, a funeral home will just drop off cremation and say, bury this better. Um, so standing with fallen comrades, we have a group of about 300 folks that we sent out an email if I was given enough warning to say, hey, we got a, an unaccompanied veteran. Um, we're going to do a service at this time. We always do honors. There's always somebody there. But if I can get an email out, sometimes we'll have as many as 80 people show up for that service. It's a really cool little program. Um, adopt a garden program. We have 100 gardens here. It's small staff. These folks are awesome. There's a good chance you'll see one when you're out here today. They come here and they help. They, they adopt a garden or two or three, and they help us tend the gardens, and that's why they're so beautiful. You know, our staff works really hard on it, but we cannot put the TLC that is needed in every garden. And usually families adopt one near their loved one. You will see Al Prisco here today. He's 90, comes every day, and he's got a little garden he adopted out here next to his wife's grave. It's a little rose garden. Mm -hmm. Those roses get a lot of drinks of water. Every time I go out there, he's watering those roses. Um, and then we talked to Barry Equity Act, and yeah, we do a lot of emails and stuff like that. We try to communicate as best we can so folks know what's going on. Um, just a couple quick things and I'll, I'll finish up. What does a military burial entail? Um, again, branches and service states do them slightly different. Um, but at a minimum, generally there's two folks here from the branch the, of the veteran. And we play taps and the, and the two people fold the flag. The number one question I get is why wasn't there a fire in detail? I would only say maybe one in 10 or 15 services has a fire in detail. Only the Army and Navy do it potentially. The Marines will do it, but they do it through the Marine Corps League. So right. the Marines don't send active the Marines here. The Army and the Air Force will send folks from the Army and Air Force if they have enough folks, which they rarely do. Anybody who's a veteran can work with a VSO, a veteran service organization like the VFW, the Marine Corps League, the American Legion, to have a firing detail if they want. Um, but it's, it's not typical. Um, and I'll be honest with you, like yesterday we did a firing detail for the Air Force. They had two guys, uh, actually a, a man and a woman. Lee Hurdle was here to play the taps. The two carried out their rifles. They did the firing detail. Lee played taps. They set down their rifle, and then they did the flag fold. They just don't have enough folks to do it. And usually the firing details for folks that are retired. That, 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 yeah, yeah, for the Navy, it's KIA only. Yeah, Marine Corps will send active duty rifles. Yeah, for KIA, 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 is, a, KIA is a totally different, different ball situation. Game. Yeah, yeah. killed in action is a totally different ball game. Everybody shows up for that. Yeah. Um, thank you. Um, yeah, and then we put the rounds from the volleys are presented to the Mexican. It's three volleys, too, but a lot of folks think 21 gun salute. Yes, it's seven. And if, again, if we had the full complement, you'd have seven people, three volleys. Usually we have two or three, three volleys. <laughs> There's some awesome pictures. I try to get all the branches in there. I'm missing the Marines. Dang, no, it's Steph. I, I did it last time. I gotta <laughs> fix that. I, I promise I'll go fix this. I'll find you a photo if you can. I've got one. I just took one yesterday, as a matter of fact. Yesterday, we had every branch was here yesterday. That's a rarity. 
So we did five burials, one from Army, Navy, Air Force, Marines, Coast Guard. Coast Guard's not here very often, so I took pictures of all of them, except for one. Um, there's some information, that's where we're at, you can find us anywhere. Um, my conclusion, this is a peaceful place. It's an awesome place to visit and just kind of walk around and center yourself. And, and I, I, I like to say just be over, just kind of be washed in gratitude. And I think it's a good place to visit. Um, places, you can learn so much about New Hampshire military history, about the community. I think that's one of my missions. One of my missions is to teach, like yesterday with the nine-year-old asking questions, and I took that opportunity to teach the nine-year-old and her sister what to do when taps is played. What to do when the flag is coming up to you. So many people don't know. Like when the flag's walking by, you have to come to attention and put your hand over your heart, you know, and people just don't know it. So I, one of our missions at the Veterans Cemetery and the association is to teach young people and old people what the right thing to do is. Um, and we, oh, we have tons of volunteer opportunities. So many. I get calls all the time. We will, we will find something for you to do. There, there's, there's no shortage of work. And look, this is a gem for New Hampshire, in my opinion. We're right in the middle of the state. And for some of you, is anybody, this their first time here? What did you think when you pulled in? It's beautiful. Yeah, it's beautiful. Yeah. Wow. You're like, hey, man, this yeah. is Bo in Bosco. What? <laughs> you know? So, yeah. You know, I mean, we're glad you're here. We hope you come back. Are, are there any questions? You're going to have a great day today. We're grateful you took the time out of your, out of your schedule. I went longer than I told Roger I would, but I, get, I can't help myself. I love this meeting. It's awesome. All right? If you have any questions, let me know. Thank you. Thank you for coming. I'm Roger Tarakad. I currently have the privilege of being the president of the Veterans Cemetery Association Board. And for you all to join us today is it's how we accomplish our mission. We were created over 20 years ago, um, about four years ago after I retired from my work job. I contacted someone and said, hey, do they need any volunteers just to do stuff? I don't want the additional responsibility of work, and so two years later I was gifted with being president of the board. But I've got to tell you how much of an honor it is because everybody on the board are volunteers. And the amount of work that these folks do, who will be with you today as well, is incredible. We keep track of the hours, but I know a lot of people, when they keep track of their hours, are a little bit short. But it's over thousands of hours a year, in addition to all of the other things that you're going to see here. One of our missions is to support Sean as cemetery director by managing fundraising, donations, and so on. And that's a really important part of our job that we're very proud of. Another mission we have is to expand throughout the adult community, the kids, the students, the selfless sacrifice of our veterans from New Hampshire over the years. The Learning Center is now gotten to a point where we're very, very proud of it. It's been processed for some 20 years. So our goal is to work with folks like you, and that's why it's so important that you're here today, to help the kids learn about, as well as the adults, learn about the fact that we exist, learn about what we offer for education. On our website, when you have a chance to go there, there's a section on the Heritage Learning Center. It's actually a page for teachers with the resources that are available. And for example, in your tour today, you're going to see the 20 points of military history. And the students love to go out there and do research with it and so on. We have put that on our website and YouTube videos in narrated, portion, in narrated form so that you don't have to necessarily come here. You can use it in your classroom. So I just wanted to point that out to you as well. And volunteering, as Sean said, is it's what we're about. I'm always amazed when I come out here whether it's going to be for flags on the 25th. We're doing, yeah, on the 25th we're doing flags. The number of people that will come up and say, I didn't even know you were here. And it, it, it's nice that they're here so they can learn about it. It's frustrating that we're saying with all the marketing that we're doing, people still don't know that we're here. But they all have the same response to it. What can I do to help? So on behalf of the Cemetery Association, the Board of Directors, and all the volunteers, please know there's no magic to it. It's contact somebody. I'm interested in doing this, whether it's serving on a committee, whether it's serving on a project. Because when we come back for wreaths, and John mentioned the wreaths in December, there's, there's always someone here who says, where do all these people come from? And I, I can, you have an estimate of how many people show up. It's hundreds of people. Uh, I think there was like seven, I think over 700. Yeah, they just, they just show up. And it's like every year you get more people to come to the cemetery for the first time. They're coming back. They're bringing a friend. 
But there are stories that we all have where I had the privilege of serving in the Army Guard in New Hampshire for 31 years. And I was at a night of, rem of remembrance once and noticed that there was a veteran there with decals on his hat. That he was with the battalion in New Hampshire that went to Vietnam, which was about the same time that I was joining the National Guard. So I had a conversation with him afterwards. And so we talked about some of his friends and so on, and friends that I had in the battalion as well. And I said to him, I said, do you get to come out here very often? And he said, you know, whenever I can get a ride, he said, it's such a safe place for me. Uh -huh. And that's why we do it. It's, you know, we lose sight of it sometimes. We see the learning portion. We see all the visitors coming through. But this cemetery means an incredible amount to a lot of people. And Sean mentioned the no-known Mexican burials. When I came to my first one, I was amazed at the number of people that were here. And teachers brought students. And scout leaders brought youngsters. And it's just amazing that somebody will come to the cemetery to honor someone who they have never met and never know, but they want to honor their service. So that's what we try to do. We would invite you if at any time today you want to reach out to Ruth or anyone else and say, how can I help? How can a student help? We'll be glad to talk to you about that. So again, thank you for giving us your time today. You're going to have a wonderful day. If you have any questions, please let us know. Thanks much. Ruth. Thank you. Um, are we doing the video, Dave? We can if you'd like. Yeah, yeah. that was the, right? a short video. It's, yeah. a, it's only a few minutes. There's a longer one and a shorter one. The story continues when the families come here and visit and walk the grounds. We get braided all the way down to the height of our grass and how our grass looks. We have by far one of the best veteran cemeteries in the nation here in New Hampshire. I want it to always be that way because it's a reflection upon our veterans and their families. It's a reflection upon the state of New Hampshire and the nation as to how we take care of our veterans. If a young person was asked why it's important to have a New Hampshire State Veterans Cemetery, I would just ask them to come and read the grave markers and take a minute and read the 20 points of history that we have around the circle of flags and meander through the walkway and read some of the monuments and just think about the people in the past that provided your freedom. A teacher out of Chichester came up and asked if she could take some photos and if she'd do a little bit more. She did some photos, she did a syllabus, and that's when it's like, wow, we've really got more of a treasure here than I had originally thought. The vision that came out of the early concepts came to be known as the 20 points of history, and the idea here is that they move the classroom around in an experiential way and read those stories, discuss those stories, in the context of people being literally buried feet from where they are. The Memorial Walkway is an area set aside that has all sorts of different monuments that families have had created or organizations have had created. They just had a basic idea of utilizing that small patch of forest behind the administration building as a place where they could put monuments back there that would not be part of the main cemetery and distract from the cemetery, but at the same time give people a place to go and reflect. And you realize in looking at them all that how many different backgrounds and cultures of people contributed to the military service of this country. And I think that's really what those monuments represent, not just all the different periods of war, but who went. What I do now is I have them find specific information about the 20 points of history, but when they go down the walkway, I have them reflect on what was most powerful to them and why, so that they have more ownership of what is of value in that walkway to them, what has personally struck them. They do have to find specific people and go to those graves. Kids have said that that, many times, is the most powerful thing for them because they've made a personal connection whether or not they knew that person. They just feel like they are able to go and almost say, 
thank you to that veteran by acknowledging them at their gravestones. When students, regardless of the age, visit the cemetery, I hope that they take away that those who served made a difference. And hopefully they take away uh, some curiosity when they get home to perhaps ask were there veterans in our family that they don't know about, that they, the conversations have never come up before, and to learn a little bit more about some family history that they may not know about before it's too late. It teaches them about family. They may have grandparents or great-grandparents who were buried here. It shows them the connection and it shows the cost of war, the real cost of war. And it's a lesson they need to learn if in the future we can ever hope to have a, at least one generation who didn't have to go to war. My younger brother was funny and he was complicated. Mike was, if anything, playful, mischievous. Like there was a time he trapped me in a sleeping bag and rode me down a flight of stairs like a toboggan. He had a personality for miles and miles and miles. He was the middle child, but the oldest boy. Had a killer smile. He was an all around good kid. My brother died on March 22nd, 2009. And he saves uh, every one of his squad mates except for one. He uh, stepped in an IED and lost a leg and some fingers and suffered some uh, mortal wounds. But nobody had any idea of how injured he was. He refused to be removed from the battlefield until after all of his men were taken away and made sure they were all okay. He was calm and cool and collected as he normally was and he made sure that every last one of them was going home. He was not leaving until they were all out, and he wanted to make sure they all made it home, and he did that. I'm very proud of him for that. He's actually buried over by the gazebo. It just kind of came naturally. We never really knew what his wishes were, and it just kind of seemed the right thing to do. Having a place like this has made it easier to focus. I have a place where I can come and still hang with my brother, is what a lot of it boils down to for me. I can come and I can joke, I can come and talk with him about things that I'm going through. Without this cemetery, I have to say that it would be a lot harder, I think, to move forward. This cemetery really did help with the healing process for me and my family. It is a place I come when I am sad and I miss him. It is a place I come to tell him good news. It's a place we come to celebrate his birthday or mourn his death. It is a place I sometimes come and just walk around for the peace and quiet of it. It's beautiful and calming. And when you walk through the grounds, you almost like release a deep breath. It's exactly where I think my brother should be, in the woods in New Hampshire, where he's from. When veterans actually were in the military, they're used to high standards. They train to high standards. So when they walk onto a piece of property that comes at the highest standards, they feel at home. George Washington was supposed to have said, the willingness with which our young people to serve in any war, no matter how justified, will be determined on how they see veterans of earlier wars are treated and respected by this country. If we can't take care of those veterans all the way up till their last day, why would anybody want to wear this uniform? When we serve, we take that oath to support and defend the Constitution of the United States. That really, in my mind, is a bilateral contract. We have to be able to take care of veterans in a way that they don't always recognize. And I think the cemetery is one aspect of that that they don't always think about up front, but realize that when their time comes and they're getting ready to make those plans, that they have a place that they can go. And I think for some of the relatives even, that's the first time that they've ever seen 
a ceremony like that just kind of hits them that their uncle or their grandfather or their father or whatever the case might be, how important their service was. We convey that message to the family that your loved one is deceased, but we honor their service here. Not just now, but we honor it every day. I think it's most important that the spouses be involved because they were the ones that had to keep the home fires burning while the service member was not around. I just recently had my wife buried there, Patricia. I know that's where I was going, and she just was taken by it. What a beautiful place. So clean. Everything was so bright. She was just kept going on and on. And I said, yeah, I kind of like it. We're all part of a club that none of us really wanted to join. And we know what the other families are feeling, what they're thinking. There's a kind of unspoken bond. And so, yes, getting together and doing all of these things, it is helpful to the families. It's almost like a, a community thing where people come and, and they celebrate instead of mourn, which I like. I like that idea much better. And so you see people laughing and joking and walking. It's not empty here. It's full of life. There's life here. This is a, a real place of connection. Connection to history, connection to the past, but also connection to the future. It's almost like it should have been here from, from the very beginning. Family members feel invited back to the cemetery. They feel warm. They feel like there's open arms to come back and, and visit their loved one. We've had friends visit from out of state who had said this is the most beautiful veteran cemetery they've been to. I take a certain amount of pride in that. That's New Hampshire. You know, that's what we do. We take care of our veterans. Some of those people who are buried there, probably like 18, 19 years old, 20, 21, they didn't really have much of a life. You know? I'm 71 years old. You know, thanks to them, we should all be very, very grateful to every one of the people who are very there. What I want for when people come to the cemetery, at least for the first time, is to realize that this is not just a place for the dead, but for the living. So, um, I've been in teacher prep for 20 years. I've been an educator for 30 years. I started out my career um, 10 years as a seventh grade, mostly um, English language arts teacher. Um, I've worked in Massachusetts, in New Hampshire, and in New Jersey, um, and then landed in teacher prep, really because I was trying to do some part-time work after I had my daughter, and was teaching basically English 101 courses at another small private institution here, and that led to teaching teachers. And so once I started doing that, I kind of didn't look back. So, uh, it's kind of crazy how that works. So, um, so I, I'm very proud. To, I, now I say I grow teachers because I bring them in from sometimes change of career, sometimes they're 18 year olds who are just embarking on the career field. So, um, that's what landed me um, in education. Now, what landed me here is an interesting story. I got an email, I don't know, four years ago, five years ago now maybe, um, just asking for some support for this learning center that was just coming on board. And um, so I attended a few of the Veterans Cemetery Association meetings. We were brainstorming about how to get more young people here to the cemetery. And so it turned into this workshop day. But what brought me to answer the email is as soon as I saw veterans, I said, oh, this is really something that's important to me. So. Um, my husband's here today. He's an Air Force veteran. We've been married for 27 years. I started out as an Air Force dependent. I had no idea what that meant. Um, 
But there I went in a U-Haul crying for like hours yeah. in the U-Haul, moving away from my family to McGuire Air Force Base. And that's where we spent four years active duty, and I was teaching in New Jersey. And prior to that, I had been, um, my parents are both veterans, and of course that was something um, important to me, but they weren't active duty when I was a child. They were long out of the military um, once I was really aware of, of, of that. So my father was drafted in the Vietnam War, and my mother enlisted, and he was from Massachusetts, she was from Illinois, and so they both land in San Francisco in Presidio, um, training to be in finance, really is what they were, um, their employment was. He ends up going to Vietnam for nine months. When they come back, they get married, and I'm born like a year later. So I'm really a product of the Vietnam War. Now, the story, story is a little sad in that I did lose my father at the age of 60 in 2007. Um, and that was due to exposure to Agent Orange. So um, that's really when I think I was 37. I really think, you know, I was like, this is really significant part of my life. When I think about the service, the sacrifice really became real, um, even though it seemed so distant at the time. So when I saw the email for this, I said, I have to do this. This is for all the veterans. <laughs> He's getting a little teary there, Eric. So, <laughs> So, um, so let me get through this without tears. Um, so what I've done is I did a little bit of research on, um, well, what are people doing you know, for um, veterans? And so what can we do? What can we bring that is something that's tangible? So if you can't get to a field trip, when I was teaching in New Jersey, it was a couple hours to get to DC. So we did DC in a day for our students because we could. The travel wasn't um, difficult, and so I chaperoned that field trip three years in a row for my eighth graders and saw really the impact that they, it had on them going to D.C., but we're a little further away here in New Hampshire, so what can we do? So I have this, I'm giving this to Ruth so that you can get this electronically. I'm not passing out the document because there are links here, but I really thought about this in terms of what is an end anticipatory set. Well, how can you prepare the students to actually start thinking about what does it mean to be a veteran and what can we do to help really tell the stories of veterans? Because when I think about it, that's the part that I kind of missed out on, even with, you know, I have letters from my father, I have stories from my mother, but not really the deep conversations that I should have been having with him when he was alive. And didn't really understand and know that there was gonna be a loss and I was gonna miss that opportunity. So how do you get the students to really understand what it is to be a veteran? So there's a really neat site here that is um, really for American heroes. I think that's what it's called. Silent heroes. So let me see if I can, I tried to get all my links up. <clears throat> So this is National History Day. So this is, and I've got this link for you here. So if you look at this site, you can actually search by state. So what's nice about that is, you know, you can choose New Hampshire, but you can also choose other states that um, students maybe have some affiliation with. So let me see, is this working? Yeah, it's spinning. Okay, so if we look at New Hampshire, <laughs> Right now there are three listed here, so I just wanted to show you what ends up being here. So what I liked about it in terms of a researcher is that there's actual photographs that have been um, provided maybe by the family um, and probably by um, some research that you might be able to see. But look at the primary documents that they actually have. So. You know, when you're teaching students about resources, rather than just going to media, now you're going to primary documents and explaining exactly what they mean and what you can be finding here. And they vary. They do have specific categories for this, so you can um, get your students to really think about these specific categories as you're showing all of these people that might be in this database. In addition to that, these two actually have some video links. So I'll show you this one. Um, this is actually someone who came from a middle school. 
uh, created this. So this is the, um, the type of work that you could support a student doing. There are sometimes you'll see a teacher's name affiliated with this work. And so I'm going to bring you down to the actual video. So this video is a eulogy that's read at the graveside of this um, fallen soldier. And it's read by the student who actually created it. So let's see if we can get the sound to work here. Eugene Pila, or Ganek, as he was known by his family and friends, was born in the middle town of Franklin, New Hampshire, on November 20th, 1929. His parents had immigrated from Poland in the decade before, and he and his four older siblings grew up speaking English and Polish at home. They lived on a small farm a few miles outside of town. Ganek was a social, good-humored young man. He took an exceptionally active role in the life of his high school. He played football and basketball. He managed the ski club. He sang with the glee club. He helped plan the junior senior prom. He organized the senior banquet. He wrote the class of 1947's history for the yearbook and acted as president of the school's swing club. In the years following Gannett's 1947 graduation, he was content to remain living with his family and working local construction jobs. His world changed completely, however, in the summer of 1951, when at the age of 22, Ganek Pila was drafted into the Korean War. Ganek became a member of the 5th Regimental Combat Team. This was a provisional infantry unit for the United States Marine Corps. He spent over seven months stateside training, and during this time, he must have shown a lot of potential because he was then enrolled in an eight-week leadership course and promoted to corporal before he shipped out to Korea in April of 1952. Here, Corporal Pila and the rest of the 5th RCT entered into combat on the northern part of the Punch Bowl on Lyme, Minnesota, in eastern Korea. He and the others took part in a kind of trench warfare, which involved nightly patrols intended as a way to gather intelligence about the enemy and to potentially capture prisoners. Night patrols were dangerous for any soldier, <clears throat> but these first few months of patrols were particularly harrowing from a new, for a new soldier with no combat experience. In a letter home, Corporal Pila wrote, not much new. Things are about the same. There are rumors galore, but nothing's definite outside of that we start running patrols tonight. I don't know yet if I'm elected to go yet or not. I've given up worrying about them. They can't last forever. And in fact, these patrols did not last forever for Corporal Pila. A little less than four months after coming to Korea, he was reported as killed in action on July 17, 1952. News of Corporal Gannett Pila's death reached Franklin, New Hampshire three days later on July 21st. The next 11-year-old niece was staying with her Pila grandparents that summer, as she always did. And she later wrote a short story about this painful event in her family's life. My grandmother opened the yellow envelope and held the single sheet of paper in her work-worn hands. The message was long, and it took a few minutes for the two to comprehend its meaning. Soon, only three words stood out in front of the tear-filled blue eyes, killed in action. It is unclear exactly how Corporal Gannett Pila died in the middle of July in 1952. What we do know, though, is that after receiving that draft notice in the summer of 1951, Corporal Gannett Pila made the choice to show up on the day of his enlistment and then, in his typical, good-natured way, to serve his country as best he could. It is also clear that Gannett Pila was well loved by his family, and that 66 years after his death, his loss is still felt. Rest in peace, Gannett. Your country is grateful for your service. Your family loves and misses you.
Okay, so that is um, an anticipatory set where you could show students really what you could do to tell the story of someone who is a veteran. So, and that, um, that cemetery is not local to here, it's in Hawaii, right? So, what I did when I, when I saw that, I said, well, how can we find out um, some more information about veterans and, in New Hampshire? And um, so I started doing some looking. And what I didn't realize is that the Library of Congress has actually um, done some documentation of interviews. Some of them are audio, some of them are video, some of them are printed materials. And even since I've done this, I spent some time I always check my links before my presentation. I tell that to my teacher, <laughs> prep students, like check your stuff. Make sure that it's uh, working and it's current. Still there. It's still there. <laughs> and this actually, this website's been tremendously updated just since we did this workshop in the fall. And it's actually got a lot more in it. They digitize the collection so that you can find um, many more um, veterans in this collection. So it's searchable by state. Um, if you, and I tried doing it with New Hampshire, it used to come up um, a little more specific about you lived in New Hampshire and you come up. Now it's anything that's in the um, identification of the veteran. Mm -hmm. So they could have served in New Hampshire, there could have been one component that was mentioned about New Hampshire. So it takes a little bit more to look at the entries. Like when I just looked for video clips um, yesterday, there were 750 mm -hmm. cataloged in here. There's a lot from Derry. So the Derry Access TV is doing a lot with interviewing. Yeah, so, so what I did, so I spent some time um, looking for some specific um, veterans. So I was looking for veterans that actually might be buried here. Um, so I was able to find someone, and I have these links for you here. So this is a gentleman who was interviewed. He's a Vietnam War vet. <clears throat> and so we have the raw footage of the video. This video is lengthy, but I will just make this story great. So, <laughs> so yeah, I actually, after I watched that video, I asked Eric about that program. Like, have you heard about this program? <laughs> So, yeah, yeah, so there's a whole, you know, learning about enlistment, yeah, and what happens um, with enlistments in some cases um, for some of these people that decided to uh, make their, uh, their time commitment be in the military instead of serving jail time. So, if you go to the National Cemetery Administration page, and you can search by cemetery, though I found that it wasn't really working for me yesterday. Um, I found better success just typing in um, Mr. Albro's name. And you can see, let's see if I can get to. The D's. So there he is, New Hampshire State Cemetery, so he's here. So this is how you can use some of these primary sources um, to create that Silent Heroes eulogy um, assignment that you saw um, as the anticipatory set. Now, another use of this would also be to interview veterans that are alive. So, um, because the Library of Congress is cataloging all of these, there is a link that I've also provided you on the lesson plan about how to actually do the interviewing. So, they give you some templates that you can provide to um, your students how to participate. Here's all the steps in actually how to do it. Sample interview questions are here. So you can actually um, walk students through, so anybody 15 or older can actually conduct the interview. So thinking about 
um, not just providing some primary resources to then have a eulogy experience, but actually to record the stories of living veterans and then getting them cataloged in the Library of Congress would be really important. So, um, so the, this is the type of, I think, experience that probably I like to call it has legs. Like, there's lots of opportunities for you to think about how to use these resources and then help those students really understand what those stories of veterans um, really mean to them. I was thinking about what Sean was saying earlier, and I'll just leave you with this. Like, Eric and I have two kids. We have a 21-year-old daughter and an 18-year-old son who's getting ready to graduate from high school in a few weeks. And we were actually at Pinkerton the other day for a baseball game where we lost eight to one. It was very sad. <laughs> but what, what they did have was their junior ROTC um, group doing presenting of the colors and playing the national anthem. And so these are these are the things that you know Eric and I kind of forget about this. But I'm watching all of the players on either side of the baseline standing and I know that he's my son, but he is standing a little straighter and his shoulders a little bit more back and his hat is off his head first out of the line of kids that are there. And why is that? Because he's been raised to understand what that sacrifice means and what all of those things that he's seen in the middle of the baseball field really mean. And so this is what I would hope that this is what we can bring to the students that we touch. And we have such a great opportunity to do that. So I'm really appreciative for all of you coming today. I don't want to hold you up anymore for the tour. How am I doing on time? You're great. We're great. Okay. So I'm actually going to go out and tour with you too. Um, right. And so then what's after tour? What do we have to get yeah. for directions? We were going to have a break, but we'll see what we need because we switched it around. And then um, Richard was going to talk. Great. Yeah. So we'll be back here after the tour. Yes. Yeah. Fabulous. Yes. Absolutely. What? I did. So, as you know, I'm writing a book about the history of the cemetery. And the way I got involved was I moved from New Hampshire in 97, the year the cemetery came online. And right away, I got homesick for Grand State. So the state connected, you know, collected books on New Hampshire history and started a website, Images of New Hampshire History. And so I photographed historical markers, photos from books, and then I started photographing veterans' memorials. And that became the most popular because people could actually read the names on the memorials. You know, a lot of times there's a memorial park and people never stop to read the names, even though their father or the grandfather could be on there. So I've always wanted to write a book about New Hampshire history, and I'm certainly not a writer by trade, but um, I've learned a lot. <laughs> so I um, thought, what could I write about? And so six years ago, I came to the cemetery, and right as I was driving in, the um, Marine Corps Memorial, was, was so beautiful with the flags and the sun. So I took 300 photos that day of the 20 points, every memorial, and that soon became the most popular page. And so before the 25th anniversary, um, I asked the Cemetery Committee Association, what about a book? And um, Sean and the association said, yeah. And, I just happened to notice, by the way, this year is going to, last year, is going to be the 25th anniversary. So they were kind enough to ask me to join the celebration committee, which was an honor for me. It was great. And so I've been doing a lot of research. I started with, um, with Mike, I mean, uh, <coughs> Mike t told me about all the paperwork, and Sean had given me a, a box of legislative paperwork. It was huge. It's made like a five-inch binder of how the laws were passed um, to create the cemetery, to get the funding, to make the adjutant general in charge of the cemetery. And so it started with that. And then I wrote about the 20 points, how that came about. And then the memorial walkway. So I finished writing about all the memorials under Reggie Jardins. And one of the things between the 
Vietnam Memorial and the Korean War Memorial, I created a database of every person on there um, in the global war on terror. So every morning I saw my database, who would have had a birthday today? So today it would have been Joseph Robert Robinson of Dover, who was uh, killed in Vietnam. So I would post that to the Dover page, and the responses I get are just amazing from family members, people who grew up with that person, um, at the high school, it's, it's just amazing. So <clears throat> I've, um, let me see, so far I just finished the U.S. Army, and that was a labor of love because every memorial has a story to tell, uh, who has an idea, you know, hey, there's nothing here for, for the Coast Guard, we've got to get one in here. So with the, the Army one, there's 38 stories to tell. And I've got two more soldiers to write about and I can move on to my dad's memorial, the U.S. Coast Guard. And um, so from there, I've probably got 11 under my card, um, about four under Sean. Then I'll write about the um, learning center the annual events of the uh, Laying of the Wreaths Memorial Day, and then future projects, which I'm proud to be on the committee with Stephanie, <laughs> is the Military Suicide Loss Memorial, which is going to be directly behind the U.S. Army. And what's interesting about it is, if you look at the Army Monument, right in the center of the top is a soldier standing proudly, saluting. And that was um, Kenneth O'Connell, who ended up taking his life. So right behind him is going to be our monument, um, memorial. So we're still working on it, so we're always looking for new members. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> so. Any help, anybody wants to get involved. Yeah. <laughs> so um, that would be you know, pretty much the, the end of the book. So I'm hoping to be done um, maybe by the end of the summer, early fall and then I'll hand it over to the publisher. But I've met some amazing people, made some great friends, and um, it's really a life changer for me. So um, if you're looking for resources, my website, Images of New Hampshire History, has a large <laughs> page about the cemetery with every, um, every monument, memorial, photographed. I've got videos. When the cemetery first came in the line, 1999, um, Lloyd Farnham was the first director. And there's a half hour video telling about how the legislation was passed, how they cleared the land. It's just amazing. Um, it answered to me so many questions. Um, I have a video, Anna Ray Boulay designed the um, Vietnam Memorial. And I met them at the Salem rest stop, and they handed me this huge Tupperware box full of photos and videos, and so I've converted that video of that dedication up to YouTube and on my page, and also the Marine Corps dedication. So I've um, been really lucky, you know, Googling people, getting information, and so it's, um, I'm almost there, I'm about 60% done. So if there's anything I can help you with, you know, go visit my website and uh, I'll be glad to, to help out. Send you some spreadsheets or <laughs> So thanks for being here and thanks for inviting me. Yeah, thanks for well, what, what he didn't mention is he doesn't even live around here. No. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Are you in Worcester? Yeah, outside of Worcester. Yeah. Yeah, so, um, yeah. so what happened was I, I worked for a company called Data General, a really old computer company that moved from Westboro to Durham <laughs> and I just finished my engineering degree. And so I moved up with, with Data General, but they didn't last too long. So I ended up working, li living mill to mills, driving to Danvers or Ipswich, 70 miles from away. So it was, it, it really killed me financially, it killed my cars. <laughs> so, so we took a paid relocation to New York. And after 9-11, the housing market crashed, people weren't buying light bulbs. So I lost my job and eventually moved to Connecticut. And about that time, that's where I started this website. And um, I did a little volunteer work for the Historical Society 
and you know all the places I lived, you know, only New Hampshire has felt like home. And uh, someday I'll get up here permanently. <laughs> um, I'm up here a lot now, so it feels like I'm here. Right, so. yeah. That's awesome. okay. Thank yeah, you. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Congrats on the book. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. one thing I want to mention is is learning about some of the um, monuments is there's a lot of authors out there. Um, for the U.S. Navy, um, Admiral Richard O'Kane from Dover um, has a big book. I haven't read it yet, but he's he's the hometown hero of Dover. Um, on the U.S. Army, have ever anybody have seen the movie that uh, hung down? So Michael Durant, who was held prisoner for 11 days, um, I interviewed him for about 45 minutes, which was it was great, and he autographed it one of his books for me. It's a great book. And so there's um, a lot of New Hampshire history books out there that you can read until mine comes out. That was like, yeah. <laughs> well, I even um, was talking to a gentleman here one day, and he's like, oh, I wrote a book about John Stark. I ended up going on Amazon and buying his books because I was like, eh. Was it Peter or something? I don't remember. It was from Boston. Yeah. Oh, okay. I didn't have to go home and look at the book. I don't remember. It was yeah. an older gentleman, but just chit chat. And he's like, yeah, I wrote a book about it. Yeah, I'm going with Peter E. Randall because they seem to specialize in the ancient history books. And after, it's just a cold call. You know, like that. Yeah. And they're out of Portsmouth. And I happen to look on my bookcase full of New Hampshire history books. And I've got to have, you know, at least half a dozen books from Peter and Randall. Oh. So. Um, hmm. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it. So, my quick history, I started at Kearsash back in the early 90s. And then, but I've been teaching for 28 years in Chinese history. What school um, were you in in Kearsash? The, well, I'll really show my age. It was the old middle school. That's where I started too. Oh, did you? Oh, okay. yeah. oh middle school. So we yeah. probably yeah. We played with some of the same people. Yeah. Um, but I have been in Chichester for um, many years now, um, doing seventh and eighth grade, originally language arts, but social studies exclusively for the past few years. Um, so I first came, I don't know, Mike, I think we figured it out somehow, but I've forgotten. I think it was like 2009 I came here, and I, I live in the next town. He says uh, yes. Yes? OK, good. Thank you. <laughs> So I live in the next town, I always drove by, well I didn't drive by that often because I don't really go Franklin direction that often, but I finally one day said, I'm going to pull in here, and I was just like, oh my gosh. I don't know about you, but I, I just felt like it was like a little mini Arlington when I walked in, you know, when I came in, and, I was, and then I drove through, and I spotted the walkway, and I was like, because oh! I'd always thought, well how could I do a field trip in a cemetery, because I've always been a cemetery lover, but I'm, people are like, are you going to take the kids to a cemetery? Like, what are you going to do? And are they going to be rude? Or are they going to be disrespectful? So when I got here, I was like, oh my gosh. So, and I spotted the 20 points. So I'm going around. My husband's literally calling me like, where are you? Um, I'll be home later. And I've got my flashlight and I'm writing notes. Of course, that was before we got smart enough to know we could take a picture with our phones and stuff like that. So, and then I went home and I wrote up all these like ways I could use it in the classroom. And then I contacted Mike and was like, do you think, and I'm thinking he's going to think I'm whack, do you think I could like do a field trip here? <laughs> you know, and that's where it all started. So what I want to share with you are some of the um, questions that I, so what I did, I hate to use the word scavenger hunt, but I kind of did a scavenger hunt for the kids because you know you bring them here and say, okay, go learn something, and they're going to be like, you know, I'm going to go sit in the gazebo and, you know, whatever. So I did like a scavenger hunt of the 20 points of history. And I went through all the monuments and did facts and stuff. So it's changed a lot over the years so much that I've confused myself over what's like the most updated version. I didn't label it very well. But um, what I was going to hand out, I just made quick copies of this so it's not, it's not really the nicest looking, but you'll get the idea. And I believe all this is on the website. But this is the memorial walkway where I went and I actually had them go and answer specific questions. When I updated it, I gave them more choice, like pick out the monuments that are most 
impactful to you because what happened with this, and this was only a piece of the whole thing I gave them, it was packet, it was just too overwhelming and they, they were like, I couldn't get through it all. And so they maybe did a lot of the walkway but didn't get to experience a lot of the rest of, of the place. The part that they probably like the best is um, they had to go to the kiosk and find the location of two people. And at, when I first started this, most people didn't even know of this place and definitely didn't have people they knew who were here. But a lot now have grandparents or uncles or, or such over the years. Um, so now they can do a little of that research ahead of time too, because if you go to find a grave, website and put in the name, it will actually, a lot of the graves here, it will tell you exactly where the location is, so you don't even have to wait for the kiosk here, which is, which is a nice perk, because the kids will be in line waiting and all that. But that's probably their favorite thing, they go to the grave and they write information about it. I did, um, I did the eulogy, which was great, um, and I had the kids who had been here for a second time, I had to do the eulogy while the others were doing sort of the scavenger hunt thing, getting familiar with the place. My problem with the eulogy was I wasn't thinking, and I just had my phone, and they were mowing the lawns. <laughs> oh, <laughs> so most of the eulogy, and every time I went to film, I was like, is that done one more? <laughs> but how can I tell them they can't do their job? They've got to mow the lawn. You know, so those didn't work out too well, but it was a really good experience for the kids. It was hard to get information. The information was hard for them to get the locals. So a lot of them were the the um, killed in action people because there's more information out there about them. Um, one girl I was really proud of, I gave her, um, uh, I can't think of this person, Gail Brandon. Oh, Brandon. Brandon. I gave Brandon, who's way back there, he was killed in action. So his dad, through a friend of a friend, we connected with his dad and she interviewed the dad and she was not thrilled that I was making her do that, but but she was the type of kid who really took on challenges, and, and she did a really good job. And it was good she did that because he passed away. Did. Yes. Um, not too long ago, so she did that about three years ago. Most of the kids you saw in the video this morning are in college. By the way, I was looking at them like, oh my gosh, they were just babies then. So, um, so I did questions for the 20 points of history. Um, even that, sometimes what I do, because like Richard, I went around and took a million pictures because I'm into photography too. Even that, sometimes I give them that on Google Classroom or whatever, and I have them do that ahead of time because a day goes by so quickly. And the, I try to line up my days where we visit here where they can place the flags on the graves. Mm -hmm. So we come right before Veterans Day or occasionally Memorial Day, but usually Veterans Day. And at 1 o'clock, they start placing the flags. So it gives the kids an hour to do it, but then we've got to get on the bus by 2 o'clock to make dismissal. Um, so a lot of times we're done, though, by 2 o'clock. Uh, even though it's 6,000 flags or something, you know. It, and it's just really nice for them to work. This past time, um, uh, Chris Pappas was here, and I think it was Maggie Hassan was the other one. And so we were, you know, starstruck over that. And, and um, they... Well, I made them team up with some military personnel who were here, which they were like, are you kidding me? But it was great, because it was just so nice to see them actually working, and then they will ask questions that I can't answer. Um, so, this one just has the Memorial Walkway in it, and this one that I did has, has everything I try to hit. So, the 20 points, Memorial Walkway, I have them go into the front. I don't know if you've been in the front here, in the building, but there's um, a little station, um, a Vietnam veteran table, a Vietnam table. Missing man table? It, what is it? It's Am I it? missing, missing man table? Missing man. Oh, I didn't even know the name of it. Okay, so there's a table there and there's a flyer. What, what do you say? I missed show on number two. Oh, oh okay. No, no, that's okay. Worst tour guide ever. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Uh, well, the first time I saw it, it was actually outside, and I had to ask what it was, and they took it outside because they were having a Vietnam veterans reunion thing out there. So I was like, what is that all about? But it gives a description of what, why there's each item, each item that is on the table, which was ample. Um, and then probably another of the very important parts is I always make them do a reflection before they leave. Because what I do with that is I take that information along with the photos I take and then so like in a couple weeks what they said about their comments about the cemetery is along with a picture from here and I do an all school presentation because we're a K-8 school. 
So I do an old school presentation in the gym with our Memorial Day observation so mm -hmm. that yeah, the kids can see, oh, this is what they did. It wasn't just a picture. Probably one of the best things, um, best memories is that one of the first times I came here, I got an email from my mom and I th thought, oh, yeah. you know how it is when you get those emails, you're like, oh no. <laughs> and it said field trip and I'm thinking, oh God, what are you going to say? But it was, I remember it because it, it was so nice. It was, she said it was the best field trip her child's ever been on and it's the most meaningful one. She was glad to see something really meaningful for a field trip and um, that because of it, they came and learned about the cemetery. And another one, a girl who, who, yeah, yeah, you know, you got the ADD kids, you know what I'm talking about, okay? She can't pay attention to anything. She brought, she made her parents come the next week, and her mother said to me, I can't even believe what happened. We came here, and she told us everything about the cemetery. Like, she knew all of it. And this is a kid you couldn't hold her attention to do anything. So those are just, you know, those proud moments as a teacher that you're like, yay! It worked. Something worked. So, anyway, please use these, tweak them, do whatever you want. I'm pretty sure Dave Auntie's on the website. Oh, he's going to get the lunch. Much more important than answering me. Um, so, I welcome you to take one of those. And if you have any questions, I'm happy to answer. Um, but, like I said, I've been through so many. Um, you know, you tweak it, you know how it is. You tweak according to what your kids' needs are. Um, but the eulogy, I absolutely love doing that. It's great research for the kids. And how did you do that? How did I do yeah, it? I was gonna structure that. Okay. Well, a lot of it was me free yeah. researching. Yeah, yeah. 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 Finding, it takes time. Yeah. Especially because they're 13, 14 year olds and just yeah. trying to make them understand, okay, there's not a lot of information, so let's look for the obituary. Yeah. Because the obituary will give you a little bit like and then also, okay, we can't get a lot of information, but he was in the Marines, so maybe you can find out something about the Marines, or, or he was here at this time period. Go research just that, not him specifically there, but what went on during, during that. Yep. Um, so actually, I had a story about that, which was a little embarrassing, but we were, we were doing one of our days here, and somebody came up and they asked us often, like, can you help me locate where this person is? And I said, oh, one of my students just did a eulogy on him. And he's like, oh, that's awesome. I'd love to read it. And I was like, oh, give me your email and I'll mail it to you. So then I was going to mail it to him. And I, I go and I look and I'm like, oh, no. This is on a kid, too. Yeah. He didn't do. It wasn't one of the better ones. So I I wrote a eulogy. <laughs> I researched and wrote the eulogy because I'm like, this family wanted to read it. And it wasn't very well done. So I'm like, Gosh, now I got to do this eulogy on this so We have the eulogy on him. That was a better of choice. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, and I, yeah, they were very thrilled to have it. And I was like, oh, oh. Anyway. Yes. I don't know if anybody's mentioned it yet this morning, but the um, all of the data that was researched and placed on the three kiosks, uh, Ruth was very, very involved with that committee working with the research company, and it's for classes seven, six through eight? Well, well we, we did it as... I said like newspapers where there's sixth grade levels. So, okay. so it's just written in terminology. Right. Just because so you, you never know what grades. Yeah, just so you know, thanks to Ruth, it was really geared towards student levels and so on, and that's where the data is um, that we were able to put on the kiosk. Because we so. all know the kids want to touch, right? Yep. They want to play. I don't know if you had which is always. So we're pretty proud of those. That was um, Six months, six months now, eight months, we've got yeah. to see it. So. Yeah. And it's fun. You know what they like the most? That's right. We're that. The thing they like the most is um, it's quite weird. Yeah. Um, yeah. I haven't, haven't done it in so long. Oh, yeah. Like, um, the game. They like to play. It's just a yeah. little bit. Um, yeah. I, I guess I like it too. You know, you know, you just do the math thing. Uh, so they're very much made for students and, and adults love them as well. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but there's a quiz on each kiosk. Um, yeah. So you could always you know, have the kids spend a little time in here. I mean, I'd love to have them outdoors, but obviously we want them here. But they're not going to stand here and read all this unless you have questions. And I think I did do some questions on this term. But they're now in here. Um, 
most of the questions anyway. So, yeah, they just, sorry. <laughs> You just want, I, to, you want I, to demonstrate how that works. I know. I know yeah. <laughs> For those people who don't have all the knowledge you have, you want to demonstrate. Yeah, yeah. exactly. <laughs> um, and now we're evolving all the time, and we're always looking for professional advice, too. And that's well, we'll tap you on that this afternoon as well. Yeah. Okay. All right, Steph. It's all yours. So I have Steph, um, as you saw in the documentary, I was providing family member. And so that's really how I got involved with the New Hampshire State Veterans Cemetery because my brother is buried here. I have some other family members that are buried here and some friends. And so um, a couple years ago, I started working with a Medal of Honor recipient named Herschel Woody Williams. And Woody was the last surviving Medal of Honor recipient from World War II and the last surviving Medal of Honor recipient from the Battle of Iwo Jima. And Woody was an extraordinary man. I met him when he was 94 years old. The man still did push-ups and sit-ups. <laughs> Wild. Um, his mission in life was to have a Gold Star Families Memorial Monument in every state before he passed away. And I met him while I was volunteering in Virginia. And he's like, so what are you doing in New Hampshire? And I'm like, oh, you know, I work a lot. I work at the police department. I'm super busy, blah, blah, blah. And he goes, you're not doing enough. You're not doing enough for the military. You're not doing enough for surviving families. Here's a challenge that I'm going to give you. I want you to build this memorial in New Hampshire. I want you to find a place that's meaningful. And so I was like, well, you know what? This place is pretty uh, extraordinary to begin with. And they have a beautiful walkway here. And so I work with a committee of survivors and, and veterans and um, Mike Horn, who I would pester very frequently, mm -hmm. um, to build the memorial that you saw on the walkway. And um, that was installed uh, in 2018. Shortly thereafter, they're like, hey, what are you doing? Do you want to come help us out and be on the board of, you know, the Cemetery Association? I said, yeah, that would be great. We'd love to. Um, and I've gotten to do some extraordinary things here, and it, very impactful things. But one of the most important things I think that I get to do is speak to people like you, um, because you are uh, bringing up our next generation of people, and possibly our next generation of service members, but also our next generation of citizens. And so um, one of the things that I did, and we're going to email this to you because it has a bunch of links, but I put together some resources for you so that as you, as you move forward in, in your teaching children and students about New Hampshire's military history or about um, New Hampshire's very broad and deep legacy of service, you have resources. But I'm also going to ask you at the end of this, what do you want and what do you need so that we have... Like, I can give you resources all day, but if they don't fit what you guys are looking for, then they're not useful, right? So some of them have already been talked about. But by far, one of your best resources is the Heritage Learning Center. Sean, the director of the New Hampshire State Veterans Cemetery. Um, anybody on the Cemetery Association, we can either help you directly or connect you with other resources, right? So. Everybody on our board of directors has different experiences. We all have different day jobs, um, different pr perspectives. So if you want somebody to come talk to your students, if you want to bring students into here, you want to take students to do a service project, we can, we can help with all of that. And um, I've got some just general contact information for that. Um, so the documentary is very helpful. Um, it, there's a wonderful, how long is that? Oh, he's fine. Is it an hour? I thought that I thought it was like 30 minutes. No, the short version. Is oh, 13 minutes. 13 minutes. There's a much really longer version like that tells the other perspectives. And um, short version is great. That's probably what's going to keep students' attention. The longer version has some other perspectives that I think are important to see also. And that's on our website. Um, the, Nash, the Nationwide Grave Locator, Find a Grave, or the Nationwide Grave Locator, both work really, really good. I always have better luck with find a grave. It just loads faster. Mm -hmm. So that's a um, super great resource there. We talked about the um, Silent Heroes and the Library of Congress stuff. I'm actually working on some projects. Um, they, they do collect the stories of fallen heroes in very much the same way, and they record the stories of surviving families as well. Um, it's a little bit buried on the website, so you have to go digging for it, but that is a great resource. Um, when you talked about eulogies, if, if people are interested in doing those eulogy projects, I actually run some independent projects for high school kids that do that. And we connect them with surviving families uh, to tell the story of their loved one. And then usually they do some type of <coughs> project in that person's name. 
Um, and so if, if you're looking for information on fallen heroes or surviving families that you want to connect with, we can put you, we can help do that. Um, the VA Legacy Program, which we, you know, is part of that, you know, Silent Heroes thing, extraordinary program. And I, I've seen it implemented at, I worked with a couple of students at the Tilton School in Tilton, and that's where they got the idea for their independent learning program and projects. It does wonders for the, the students. But also a really great resource, which is right in your own communities, is your local VFWs and your American Legions. Those veterans' stories um, are first-hand accounts of service, first, and their legacies of service can be passed on through those students. And, uh, they would be a great resource to talk to your class or have your students go and, and talk to those that work at a VFW or an American Legion. Um, just a wealth of information and knowledge that can give you a first-hand account of what it was like to serve in Vietnam or what it was like to serve in the global war on terror or in Afghanistan or Iraq, depending on what you're looking to teach them about. Unfortunately, um, you know, we, are, we don't have many, if any, World War II veterans left. You're still going to find a few Korean War vets, but um, their first-hand accounts are being lost because nobody's recording their information. And so those eulogies or uh, those students recording that story for them is very helpful and that it can be recorded either with the VA or we have actually a stories and service kiosk here that we record those stories, that we record New Hampshire's military history in. Um, over the summer, where it's transferring to an online forum, an online interface, so you can do it right from home. Uh, or the student can do it right from home, where they can submit uh, the stories of a veteran, um, and they can scan photos, they can upload documents, so it could be a family member, it could be a friend, or somebody that they did a project on. So they're impacting uh, research that can be used by a student in the future, which is kind of important, right? They're giving resources to others. But again, I, we don't know what you need unless you tell us. So if there's something that you're like, hey, this would be great for the classroom, let us know. Like if you're thinking in your head, well, this is all great, but what about X, Y, and Z? Please share that with us so we know what to develop for you or we know what to source for you. So does anybody have any ideas or thoughts? Like, like maybe the question, like any ideas on what you've seen today of how maybe oh, you yeah. could use it? Yeah. How, how you envision, you know, you get the teacher label like, going like, how could you see this? Because that's important to us right. too. Like I know how I use it, but that doesn't mean everybody else wants to. I like the whole idea of just the kids um, you know, just researching somebody and, and getting to like do the whole background story on that particular person and then you know, the ultimate would be to obviously come and visit. Mm -hmm. But um, you know, and the other thing is I was thinking is I don't know if you guys go to schools and actually that's the other option so for us we could get out. Right. So yeah. different members of the association could do different things, right? Some people are veterans, some people are teachers, some people are surviving family members. Sean can talk, the cemetery director can talk a lot about the cemetery. So it really depends right. on what your school is yeah. looking for, what what they want, right? You know, um, maybe having some of the veterans come and talk on Veterans Day would be appropriate, yeah. or maybe working with some survivors to come and talk to you about the true meaning of Memorial Day might also be appropriate, but right. that's for you to know and your students to know like what, what, what would work best for you. Yeah. Um, but everybody, you know, they're happy to come out and talk to you. Yeah. You just have to reach out and, and we'll make sure I'm going to send you this in an email because there's a bunch of links, but how to reserve the learning center, how to make contact with the cemetery or the board. Um, to see, you know, if somebody is available to come talk to your class or available to, to talk to whoever about whatever topic. Yeah, because you might not be able to bring them on a field trip, but at least if we can get them educated, they might come on their own, you know, yeah. on the weekend or something, you know. Or... Well, I'm sorry. I was saying, I, was saying, I think there's so much that students don't know or even adults don't know about the respects of the flag. They don't, you know, that's not mm -hmm. taught anymore. It's not something that they're familiar with or. You know, when Taps was playing, what do we do? We see all these people saluting. Do we salute? We're not veterans. Like, you know, lots of things like that, that just that decorum that is, I, I feel yeah. like people used to know, and now it's just kind of a, So if I was to find a resource for you, like yeah. for the military funeral honors, and maybe we could get an honors team 
to, to come and show you what protocol is while they yeah. perform honors yeah. to yeah. teach something like Why that. Why is the flag flown okay. like that? Or yeah. folded like that? Like all of that. Why okay. is it flown at half mass? It's stuff that kids So like flag protocol. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I, have a, I have a fun story about that actually. Um, so the only complaint that I've ever had in all the years coming here was one year the flag went by and kids were not respectful to it. And mm -hmm. of course, we were just talking about it. And of course, I was horrified and I'm thinking, I don't even know. I mean, I know you take your flag off and, and the parade and all that stuff, but I never thought about it, so I never told the kids. So the next time we came, I was like, you need to make sure, because that was, you know, and, and we never get a bad report. And so they're coming out of the building here because they get changed over there to go do, do it. And we're like in front of the building and the kids saw them and they're all like, <laughs> <laughs> and so they had to wait for them to come all the way. And I was like, okay, good. <laughs> then I was like, you don't have to do it that early. But it was cute. But it's true. They, yeah. they have no idea. Yeah. It's fine. yeah, and I mean, I was just at Arlington recently, and it was just kind of sad because so many people have no idea, and it's kind of disrespectful, and they don't know that they're being disrespectful, so you're not upset about it, but it is just something that has been lost over the years. And every community has an untapped resource of veterans and survivors. Like, every community in our state has veterans and survivors, and they're local, right? So maybe their kids go to your school, maybe, you know, they're, you know, so don't be afraid to talk about these things or ask, like, Hey, you know, anybody that they remember as a veteran may want to come and talk to us or right. any of those things. So obviously around survivor topics, things might be a little sad. Like, you know, I was watching my mom and my brother who are not here anymore. Get a little choked up. But, you know, their story is extraordinary. And every um, grave, I always say this, every headstone out there is somebody's life. And it's a story. And they yeah. have family. And they have friends. And they have people who love them. And, that, and their story does not end, right? So when you tell their story, their legacy continues. When you have those kids from Pinkerton that came and cleaned headstones, those kids read that headstone, they saw that name, and they carried that person's legacy of service on by doing service for others. And that's how you keep those stories alive. That's how you keep their legacy of service alive. And that's really important. Like I said, this, this place is about life. It's, it's, not, um, it's not solely about death. There's a lot of life here. I'm here a lot. Um, Sometimes you'll find me, in, I speak at a lot of places, and so I come here and I'll sit over there and write my speech or sit in the gazebo, because it's peaceful. Mm -hmm. It's not sad. It's um, very comfortable here. On Memorial Day, do you guys ever um, just read the names of everybody out loud? I say that just because I lost a family member in 9-11, and I know that, like, you know, the anniversary of 9-11, yeah. um, they read the names out, and I know that my family, like, has been invited to go and read some of the names out loud. Yeah. It was just really impactful to actually hear the names out loud. It yeah. just feels like it's a lot of names now. <laughs> yeah. 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 yeah, I think it's a lot of that is, I mean, you could speak to it better, but a lot of dignitaries type of, like, the Veterans so, Day, I mean, the Memorial Day ceremony. I can remember one ceremony where they were ringing the bell and I was trying to think of it. Uh, so it's Run for the Fallen usually will do yeah. something. Yeah. Um, so Run for the Fallen was doing two things. They haven't done the 9-11 ceremony that's the ones now, but um, they ring a bell for every person that was lost on 9-11. Yeah. And um, they do a, um, that's out in the seacoast. I don't know if they still do it at Odeon Point, but if you give me your information, I'll do a little research and get it to you. Get you the info of what yeah. they're doing. Um, be cool. There's another thing. If you can get your kids to go to some of these um, ceremonies, they'll, um, they'll see, like, take them, you know, uh, this year, the Memorial Day uh, ceremony here is on Tuesday, you know. Which is good. No, it's better right. that it's a school day in some ways. Right. Because then you, if you know in advance, oh, you, you can take the your kids. Sure. Right, take the kids. Come see. Um, listen to the, the people speaking, but also look at the families that are walking around and eating flowers. It is not necessarily a, a solemn and sad day. Right. It's a day of remembrance and gratefulness. What do you guys do here on Memorial Day? What's that? Sorry, um, so normally the ceremony is on Memorial Day. This year they, they moved it to the Tuesday. Yeah. Um, but uh, they have a, a, you want to talk about Memorial Day services? You know better than me. Well, typically the, the ceremonies here has always been on the 30th of, or in essence, the real Memorial Day. Right. Mm -hmm. And so that's why it's moved around. Um, yeah. the, mm -hmm. And it's usually at 11 o'clock. Um, as directors, we work extremely hard to keep it to an hour. <laughs> as much as we tell the staffers to tell their bosses to <laughs> keep their speeches truncated, uh, some of them just think, you know, <laughs> the best thing they can do is just say, you know what, 
you know, thank you for being here. And, but, yeah. Yeah. but yeah, it's nice because you've got all the veterans <coughs> groups here. Usually on the, uh, we went over there in the infield, it's around the flagpoles. Mm -hmm. And you'll have different veterans groups, even have representatives or, or honor guards, you know, mm -hmm. here. Um, the big thing is, was to try to, uh, they used to do it on Veterans Day, but the veterans group said, please don't have it on Veterans Day because you're taking all the veterans from, especially state commanders and all the, right. the key people, you're pulling them out of our communities. We want to do right. the celebrations in our communities versus at the state. Mm -hmm. yeah. and, and June 1st, I would have looked bring the kids, but it's just conflicting with things at school, but there are two events going on on June 1st, and I can't even think what they are right now. Um, did Sean write that? Picking up the flags. Picking up oh, the flags. Oh, yeah. So like everybody like, oh, yeah, that's what, everybody loves putting the flags in, but nobody shows up to take, to yeah. take care of them. So I was going to bring the kids, I wanted to bring the kids for that, and then the, the planting, doing the planting. Because yes. the people can leave plants of the certain, you know, potted plants on the graves, like a week before, right around Memorial Day, and then all those plants get picked up and put in the gardens. And then since Sean's worked a volunteer program and has adopted a garden, more and more before we used to, the, the staff would do it when they could get to it. Now the gardens have improved under Sean significantly, and so he's even advertised to come up at, I think it's like 11 o'clock yes. on June 1st, and help us plant the plants. So the investment that people have put and, and with their loved ones mm -hmm. actually survives and grows and flourishes in the summer. Time. So would it link to so and one o'clock? Yeah, so would it link to like the cemetery's event calendar be helpful so that you knew right. like, yeah. hey, like yeah. this day is the day that they're putting out the flags. This is the day that they're picking up the flags. This is the day that they're doing this event or that event. So you could maybe join into that type of thing. Yeah, That's well, helpful. Get Sean's email address yeah. so they can get yes. the newsletter. Yep, I um, have that as well. Because he does keep you up to date on what's going on at the cemetery. Mm -hmm. And I have um, all the ways that you can reach, you know, the New Hampshire State Veterans Cemetery, the Cemetery Association, the Learning Center. I've got information on how to reserve the Learning Center if you want it. Um, I just don't know what else you might want or need as you consider the resources that we have or the facility that we have. And if it didn't get mentioned, I believe, if you bring a group up too that, you know, especially if, if Sean knows and maybe get some volunteers to show up, we can set up tables and chairs and uh, grass here so you can have a picnic lunch. He's yeah. always been... You were always so right. right about that. Yeah. We came on here and we were freezing. It was Veterans Day and we were set up over there. He had all the tables over our big thing of hot chocolate and <laughs> go in, get a little drink, go back out. But I do have to say, Mike and I are pretty good yeah. tour guides. Yeah. We try to fit it in. You know, again, we've got a passion for it. You know. yeah, right. But if so. you can, if you come and you can get a volunteer, like somebody active military, somebody. You know, the kids are going to listen to them better than they're going to listen to them. Right. Well, like you did with the honor guard, you get some, you know, if you can catch the honor guard just to talk about what they do. Yes. Yes, right. It's fantastic. So that's yeah. a really good reason for, you know, talk to the hurdle. Yeah. Talk, talk to the viewer. He had, has mm -hmm. just an enormous amount of information. And, um, you know, Roger's got some information there about if you're interested in volunteering with the cemetery, you can fill out one of those. Or if you know anyone. If, if you're talking to somebody and, and you think they'd be an ideal candidate to come out and volunteer, you can fill out one of these cards, leave them with Ruth, and um, we can get you some information on that. Thank you. So I'm not an educator. I know one now. <laughs> um, what about would educators be willing to, like, say, well, I took the crew up, right? Because I'm only thinking, right, one teacher, I want to do this, but I don't know exactly what to do, but maybe you've done it 12 times. Mm -hmm. Some way to post a list, obviously be voluntary of, hey, I did this. Here's my contact mm -hmm. information for teachers yeah. to exchange ideas themselves, yeah, 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 right? Because that. sometimes that's hard, right? What do I do? Or, yeah. hey, what's a good idea? What did yeah. you do? Right. 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 That's more like a, a blog. Well, it's like okay. a high school teacher on a book one makes it part of state house right. visit, cemetery visit, you can't just yeah. file together with yeah. the civics class. But you might be able to reach out to that teacher right. and say, hey, what did you do, yeah. what were some of those ideas, what were what was in yeah. On, on that good. note, what you were talking about, another uh, thing that I hear from schools is like the cost of buses and things like that. Yeah. If you reach out to a local VFW or an American Legion yeah. and you say, hey, I want to take my students up to New Hampshire State Veterans Cemetery um, <laughs> for a day, they will probably help you pay for those buses. No guarantee, every um, VFW and American Legion is different, 
but uh, the couple times that um, I've had teachers reach out to them, they've said yes, and they've also sent people from that VFW or American Legion up to go around uh, with those kids. So um, I've only had two so far, but uh, it's worked out. So again, can't guarantee anything, but because everyone is different, they have different bylaws and different ways that they, they allocate their funds, but it's worth a phone call or it's worth an email. Um, and you might also get the great resource of having a veteran go with you. That, that's worth a lot. Right? Yeah. That, that's yeah. untapped, like yeah. untapped resource right there. Our, our veterans are um, looking to be engaged. So, you know, ask, ask the question and talk to them. And to see young people right. paying attention. And it's yeah. not recruiting, it's passing on information. Because yeah. yeah. there are some people out there that see somebody in the uniform and say, no, we're recruiting. No, no, no. It's like a nurse or a doctor or whatever else. We're just trying to. But I will say that I have had two students join the military and they said it was in part from being more Wow. It was what got them going with their interest in the military. Yeah. Was coming here as eighth graders or seventh graders. Do you come for Veterans Day and Memorial Day? Right? Uh, no, I, it's usually Veterans Day. Um, we like to do the flags, so we come. The problem is the flags don't start till one o'clock, so we have to hurry up um, and to get back to school. But that's fine. It goes pretty quick. But it is pretty quick, and you know what? They're you know the attention span. Um, no. But no, I did one year do both, and it was a little too much. They got a little too comfortable, and right. that's when I started to get the, a few behavior issues. Do you mind me asking you what how many students do you typically have with you? Um, fifty, okay. maybe. Okay. I usually bring I usually bring seventh and eighth grade together yep. for small school. Yep. So fifty, sixty at the most. Okay. Um, but. It's What's the safe. biggest group you guys have ever had yeah. as students, like number wise, come visit the cemetery? Probably, probably about that, a couple okay. buses, just 16. Okay. Maybe one bus, maybe maybe two staggered, because we've got some, at least when I was here, they flip flop State House here, oh. and then, and then oh, flip right. it, you know, because okay. State House, I guess, is about a half day. Jerry and I teach sixth grade social studies, okay. and I have half, yes, half, and we both have 16. That's what we can, you know, yeah. the association knows typically somebody can be here to help. Yeah. Another thing I, I've done to kind of maximize it was a stop the hand adjustment okay. memorial mm -hmm. on the way up through Boston. Okay. Not yeah. that there's not a lot you can do out there, but right. at least they've learned the history and they go out yeah. and they like walking on the train tracks. And yeah. So there are other things okay. around. But again, like, Rich, insane resource that means everything. <laughs> so we can connect you with that. But if there, if you think of something that you're like, hey, like all of a sudden it was cool, but we also need this. Let us know because right. we want to support you in bringing people here, or we want to support you in having us come to you and use this great resource and, and use the resources that we have access to. So keep us posted. Yeah. Right. Trailers, and uh, they come out of the Concord office down on the state reservation to to do. Uh, do services and such. But then Roger Dejan, you saw him in the photo maybe, he was the second director of the cemetery. He came on board in around 2000, I want to say 2000, 2001. He's the one that worked with the National Cemetery Administration to, uh, to get the, this expansion done and then he worked a follow-on expansion that was just under construction when I started in 2008 to put section A and section B in those two sections of columbariums were add-on. And before I left in 2018, we had an expansion to go out that way. So you'll see the parking area. That was, Sean ultimately was here for the construction. I was here for the, you know, the design, working with National Cemetery Administration and the engineers. But we expanded columbariums on both A and B just to give us some more and flesh it out and finish it off. I forgot to show you on the way back in, if you go in through the administration building and down the hallway, there's a master plan that's on the wall and it shows that there's really 20, 25 acres of the, how many, how many acres? Uh, is, that, uh, let me see. is it 100 I, something? I thought it was 112. Yeah, oh. buildable. I mean, there's, there's some that aren't buildable, but I mean, you see the master plan and that's why for 80 years with more expansions, this, this is... It goes out that way, there's a plateau, it wraps around because there's a big gully in the middle, but 
it's going to be as spectacular or more spectacular as they build it out. So now I'll show you where the chapel is. And you'll
This was the first monument in place um, for the Vietnam veterans, Paul and Ann, uh, I'm sorry. Uh, Ray and Ann Goulet? Yeah, Ray, Ray and Ann Goulet out of Manchester. This was there, they did a lot of leadership. And the names on there matched with what's in Washington. So if somebody was in New Hampshire, but they went to Boston and enlisted, their names are on the Massachusetts monument in Washington, so it's, a, it's not on this one. And typically, we'd have, you know, a couple times a year, somebody would walk in and say, why isn't my ancestor on the, on the monument? And fortunately, the backstory got passed along to me, so I could help explain why it was. And you notice they've got a couple that were, they weren't, they've got uh, remains that were returned, and so they added them in. And over time, they've added some benches. They've also added some benches. Uh, but all this stuff out here is through uh, committees and it's private private funds that put it all out here.